Well, good morning, Church One. It's great to be with you today. Um, I live over uh, by Towson University, kind of off Egberth Road. And one of the things that strikes me often as I'm driving and I just see these hordes of university students kind of walking back and forth to the campus is I look at these young lives and I think every one of these people has to find a life. When they leave Towson University, they have to like head out into the world and find things to do and people to love. They need to find a life. There's times where I get overwhelmed with just how are they going to do it? What's going to happen? I I remember back my freshman year at the University of Richmond, you know, I showed up at campus. I'm trying to register for classes and I went into the career counseling office. And I remember sitting there and talking to the person and saying, I have no idea like what I'm supposed to do with my life. Like, isn't there a test or something that you should give me that tells me what I'm supposed to do? And um, I never got, <laughs> you know, a great answer. But I think what was happening and what was bubbling up, and it's something I think about a lot, it's like I was hungering uh, for a purpose. Uh, I was longing, I've come to see, I was longing for like something really deeply spiritual. Um, and I would, I would call it a sense of calling, that there was uh, someone, and I, I ultimately, I think being God, that was calling me into a life, a life of purpose and direction and meaning. It was a, it was a deep longing that is never uh, simply filled. And I think this longing for calling is something that is deep within so many of our souls. The lectionary uh, over the course of the summer has us in Genesis, and it really has us kind of in the stories of Abraham and Isaac. And I'd love to bounce around those stories this summer. And I'd love to, there's many different angles, many different ways we could bounce into those stories. But I would love uh, this summer to bounce into them in terms of life questions. How do these, um, these accounts of the lives of Abraham and Isaac speak to the deeply human questions uh, that ultimately only God can fulfill? And this week, I'd love for us to look at this idea of calling because we're gonna be in Genesis chapter 12. And in many ways, Genesis 12 is a deeply pivotal chapter in the entire Bible that ultimately gets fulfilled by Jesus. And the rest of the Bible in some ways is about the promises made in Genesis 12. So it's deeply theological, deeply you know, scriptural, all that kind of stuff, but it's also about a calling. It's about God's, first calling to Abram, who ultimately becomes Abraham. And so I wanna, I wanna read that and I wanna talk about this concept of calling. And I wanna make four brief points about calling and believe it or not, not only do they start with the letter C, they start with C-O-N. And these four brief points are the context of calling, the content of calling, the conflict of calling and the consummation of calling. So let me read it and then I'll pray for us. Genesis 12, one to nine reads this way. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with them. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took his wife, Sarai and his brother's son, Lot and all the possessions that they had gathered and the persons whom they had acquired in Haran. And they set forth to go to the land of Canaan. When they had come to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the Oak of Moray, at the time the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there, he moved on to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. 
And there he built an altar to the Lord and invoked the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed by stages toward the Negev. Let me pray. Lord, this is your word and it is your word that calls us. And so as we begin to talk about this, I pray that you would give all of us like a capacity wherever we find ourselves in life to think about what you are calling us to, Lord Jesus. Open our hearts, open our mind. May uh, your word and your spirit um, enable us to hear your voice. It's in your name we pray, amen. So the very first thing we're gonna talk about is the context of this calling. And for context, if we're in Genesis 12, it's always good to go back and look at Genesis 11. Genesis 11 begins with the story of the Tower of Babel, which is kind of after Noah and his sons get off the boat. And it's really a time where humanity's in a, in a great season of chaos. And it begins to recount the story of, of Noah's son, Shem. And it talks about the different generations and it gives seven different generations um, till it gets us to Abram's father, Terah. Now, um, it's interesting because Genesis 11 really just lists the generations like that and just really just gives us names and, uh, and years. But when it gets to Abram's, they're calling him Abram at this point, not Abraham yet. But when it gets to Abram's father, Terah, in Genesis 11, we get three pieces of extra information kind of just inserted real briefly in the account of Terah's life. In chapter, in chapter 11, verse 28, it lets us know that Terah had three sons, you know, one of them, Abram, but another son had died before Terah had died. It just mentions that, that Terah's son died before Terah died. And it, it mentions then that there's this sort of fatherless um, grandson named Lot hanging around. And so we have this introduction of, uh, of Terah's loss and Lot. It mentions in chapter 11, verse 30, that his other son, Abram, was married to Sarai, but that they were infertile and they had no kids. And lastly, it mentions that Terah uh, took his son, Abram, his nephew, Lot, his wife, Sarah, his other son, his, his other son's wife, and they left. They left their homeland in Ur, which would have been down by Iraq. And they were heading to Canaan, which is modern day Israel. But they couldn't go straight across because of the desert. So they had to go up first north to Turkey and then they go back down. They were gonna go back down south to Canaan. But um, this is about a 1500 mile journey. It's like saying that you're gonna set out today to begin to walk to Denver, Colorado. And this, this is what they do. And it's interesting, the context um, is really sort of these three little pieces of information kind of create a sense of barrenness. There's an emptiness that kind of precedes what, we've, what we ended up reading here in Genesis 12. You know, there's the death of the one son, there is the infertility of Abram and his wife, and there's this leaving, just up and leaving your homeland. You know, there's an emptiness, there is a barrenness. And um, it is in this context, right, that God speaks to Abram and he tells him to leave, right? It's interesting to kind of consider um, that callings in our lives often come from a place of emptiness. When we think about calling, I think a lot of times we think about just success and you know, just fulfillment and all of this stuff. We don't often think that when we really feel called by God, it often comes from a place of emptiness. I remember hearing my mom recount her spiritual journey and she said, um, one of the key things is that she was in her 20s and she sort of was married, had young kids. She thought she was living life to its fullest. And there was a song at the time by Dionne Ward, Warwick that was out, it was, came out in 1966 and the song was called, What's It All About Alfie? I don't know the song, maybe some of you know that song, but 
uh, it, something about the words uh, struck my mom. She was like kind of living the classic suburban life uh, with the kids and the station wagon and all that kind of stuff. And she's thinking, is this it? Like there was a certain emptiness that she felt and that emptiness actually is what opened up her heart to hearing the voice of God. Callings aren't for the confident or for the content or the satisfied or the comfortable. To really be called uh, is kind of comes from a place of emptiness. Why is that? Well, I think that one of the reasons is because if we're going to be called people, it doesn't, your calling doesn't come from a place of ego. You see, everybody kind of wants their life satisfied to work, you know, but, but when you insert yourself like too much into even your own life, and when you insert it, making your own life all about you, and it's about you, like it's funny how that presence of the you sort of messes up your life. Real callings are about something other than ego. And so they often come from a place of emptiness. You have to, you're, to be called means that you are ultimately a giver and not a taker. So often I think we look for purpose and we, we, we want to jump into that relationship or that career or this community or these, this group of friends. And when we're moving into those places, we're not moving in as a giver coming from a place of emptiness, really. We're moving in as takers, wanting to take from everything. And I think when that happens, we, we, we fail to be called people. And so it's very often that God uses empty places to call us. You know, I wonder this morning, like as you're thinking about that, you know, if you have the opportunity to think about what are some really like empty places? Where are places that like really aren't working, that you're not satisfied, that you're, you're struggling, um, you don't feel like it fits? It's dangerous, I know, for me even to bring that up because it sort of elicits a lot of pain and hurt. But it seems to me like called people often get called out of their emptiness. And so I just kind of want to ask you to like think about that a little bit. Like where, where is your emptiness? And could God be speaking to you? So the first is the context of the call. The second is the content and we really see that content in verses one to three in chapter 12. It says, the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. There's this, this, this calling, the first word, you know, God speaks like that. That's another part of callings is that it doesn't generate from inside of you. It is God speaking. It is God intervening into life. And that's what a calling is. It's not, again, it doesn't, it doesn't just bubble up from inside of you. It's actually God intervening into your life. And we long for that. But often what, one of the things that happens is that God moves us into uncomfortable places. And that's what happens. He says, to, to, you've got to leave. Uh, the commentator, Walter Brueggemann says this, to stay in safety is to remain barren. To live in risk is to have hope. You know, I don't know, it says, remember we talked about chapter 11, Abram moved with his father, Terah. They moved, they were supposed to go to Canaan. That was the reason they left. They got up to Haran up here in Turkey and they stayed, they stopped. They got halfway and they stopped. And it was only Abram that God spoke to and says, you need to leave this place where you're stopped, where you're stuck and move. And that first move was probably an uncomfortable move. That's hard for me. I love to count my pennies. I love to schedule my days. I like to comfortably fit in wherever I am. I enjoy things like familiar things and routines. One of the most challenging th things I find about finding Jesus and answering the call of God is that he challenges me not to stay stuck in my comfortable. Mark chapter eight, verse 35, this is the words of Jesus. Whoever would save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake and the sake of the gospel 
people find it. The context is emptiness. Emptiness. The content is often uh, uncomfortable for us. I remember hearing uh, Trent Dilfer, who was the quarterback for the Ravens when they won their first Super Bowl. I heard him years and years later speaking at an FCA banquet, and it was one of the best banquet talks I ever heard because he was talking about that Ravens team, and he said, you know what made our, that team so special is that we were uncomfortable. They had had five weeks during the regular season where the offense hadn't scored one touchdown. It was a team that felt uncomfortable. And it was the uncomfortableness, he said, that made him feel like he was a part of something special because it was forcing them to press in, to do more, to figure things out. God often calls us into uncomfortable places. I think I've mentioned before, we've been watching The Chosen and I really appreciate a lot of it. And uh, the episode we just watched is, was the episode where Jesus sends out the disciples two by two uh, to go out and begin to preach the message of the kingdom. And I, I like the take The Chosen put on it because it, it, it viewed it from the perspective of the disciples and they're thinking, wait, you're just, you're gonna leave us and you're just asking us to go do this? Like, what are we supposed to do when we get there? Why are you telling us this? And it sort of really like touched on kind of the uncomfortableness often that happens when God first begins to call us. Empty and uncomfortable equals open. I think that's what's going on here. The context and the content of these callings, like, like open up the heart of Abram. Because in verse two to three, listen to what it says. And I want you to listen for a particular pronoun. This is God speaking. Verse two, he says, I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. I, 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 there are several eyes here when God speaks. He says, Abram, you are now open. You're, you're empty, you're uncomfortable, you're open. And I'm gonna pour into you these amazing gifts that you will be a blessing. I'll give you a land, I'll give you a nation, I'll give you an inheritance and you will be a blessing. One commentator on this passage says that these promises that God makes are represent what we all crave. We all crave to be used, to be connected, to have the heritage, to have all of the stuff right? But in order to do it, we have to be empty and uncomfortable. And that's what God is pouring into Abram now that he's able to do this. And, 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 and God will, like when he calls you, right? What, what I want you to hear is he's not calling Abram to be miserable. He's not calling Abram to be a failure. He's calling Abram in such a way that he can fill him and he can give Abram what he deeply desires, but it has to come from a different spot. I wonder this morning, like, where are you uncomfortable? Is there a place, right, where God is like putting you in uncomfortable ways? I think of us as a church, right? You know, like, it's not easy to not own your building, to rent it, makes us vulnerable. It's not easy to be a small church, like trying to get all the resources we need with volunteers and all these kind of things that we talk about. Like it's, it's uncomfortable. It really is. But it, 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 in the best sense of the word, if it, it continues to open us up to God and to turn to God and help us realize that we need God, then maybe we are in fact like living out our calling because as we realize, if, we're think, if we think we're the little church that has all the answers and figured it all out, we're not gonna be a blessing to the world. But if we're a little church that remains open and dependent on God, we can bless this world. So there's the context, there's the content, and now there's the conflict. Because as the story goes on, Abram um, 
Abram goes into, he gets to the land of Canaan. He, he gets to the land that God promises. And that starts in verse four. And we're not going to look at all the details because it, it becomes very geographical at this point. It's very interesting how concrete, to use another C-O-N word, this, this calling is. Your, your calling is meant to be in a concrete place and time and space. Like we're here in America and, you know, the, the, 21st century, like where to live it out, right? Like, you know, and Abram's living it out, but, but he's living it in a place of conflict. There's a great little uh, line in verse six. It says, at that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Wait, God, I thought you called me to this land. Now I get to the land and <laughs> there's other people in it. And there's other people that don't seem to kind of care about you and they don't seem to have a sense of you're calling them all to the land. They just happen to be here. They're just living their lives. They're in some ways, they're in conflict even with your calling on my life. You know, now it's interesting and I want you to know this and we're not gonna be able to cover this. Like God's intent was to bless those people too that God in Genesis 12 is beginning to turn the way he's working to save the world. And the way he's working is to call a, a people to himself. And ultimately from that people will come Jesus. And so God's plan is to bless the world. It's not just to, you know, explicitly like just work with Abram and ignore everyone else. But yet in the midst of God's working in this uniquely kind of particular way with Abram, there is the reality that there are many out there that are oblivious to the workings of God. And Abraham has to live this life, you know, like, like amongst people that aren't referencing God at all. You know, I think it's interesting when we think about one of the hardest things of living a called life living a life you know, where we're trying to pursue God's purposes for us, is that there are plenty of people out there who seem to live lives without any reference to God at all. They're just living their life. They're, they're in the land living their life. And yet we as called people are almost sort of called to live lives as immigrants. We're, we're in a new land where we're trying to make our lives, but we come with this reference point to something outside of this land that puts us here. It's, you know, uh, a called life, as one, one person said, is often the way of a sojourner, right? Hebrews 11 talks about this a lot when it talks about God's calling and it mentions that we're to be sojourners in this world. I've been listening to a podcast on the hist Irish history. Uh, it's been interesting for me and it talks about the great potato famine. And in the, I think it was the eight, late 1800s or mid 1800s, there was a great potato famine in Ireland. And the net result is that Ireland went from a country of 8 million people to a country of 6 million people in a pretty short time. 1 million people died of starvation and another million people emigrated. They left the country because there was no hope for them. And I'm listening to that podcast and I'm, I have Irish heritage and I'm thinking that famine is the reason I'm sitting here in Baltimore right now. Some ancestor of mine lived the life of a sojourner. He left, he went to another land and he lived you know, with this connection to Ireland, but yet in a new place. And often as called people, we have to live this life of sojourners that like we're living amongst people that aren't referencing God at all and seem to be living like full lives and no sense of any deeper calling or purpose. And it can be very conflicting. You know, it's interesting to think about these Canaanites. They were, they were obviously, you know, a threat to the people of God in a physical way, but they were also probably even more so a profound spiritual threat because they're just living their lives and everything seems to work for them. Like, you know, why am I taking this calling thing so seriously? Why am I sensing that I still need to be connected to God and living out of a greater purpose? To live a called life, right, is to live a conflicted life. If there's no conflict, I wonder if you're called. You know, that's really a hard thing to consider. 
but it's a reality. To live a called life is to live a conflicted life. And the reason is because it's not a life of comfort. Again, I, I, I think of this often, like I think of calling as like, oh, it just all works out because I'm in this perfect spot where my gifts are utilized and everyone loves and appreciates me. No, like that's not actually like the ultimate goal of a called life. The ultimate goal of a called life is to be a life of faith. And that gets me to my last point, the consummation, the consummation. You see, Abraham is not actually a model of success. He has deep flaws, some he never gets over. And he doesn't achieve a whole lot of his life goals or even the promises that God seems to give him or gives him in this passage. When he dies in the promised land, instead of a great nation, he's got one child and the only land he owns is a burial plot where his wife is. That's it, when he dies. He doesn't, he's not the paragon of success or satisfaction. But Paul, the apostle Paul in reflecting on the life of Abraham in the book of Galatians and Romans says that what Abraham ultimately is, this is a, he's a model of faith. That the consummation, the fullness of a called life is found in faith, found in faith. It says, Paul talks about Abraham and he says, he believed God and God reckoned it to him as righteousness. Actually, Paul doesn't say that. The author of Genesis says that. Gen the, Moses who wrote Genesis is looking at Abraham and says, well, you know what the key about Abraham? He believed God and God reckoned it to him as righteousness. And that's what, and, and it, it was his faith that led him to this place of righteousness. Now righteousness, I know I've talked about this before in other contexts, but righteousness is one of those religious words that you're like, what, what does that mean? You know, I've, I've, again, I've said this before, the only time I've heard the word righteous, like in everyday talk is uh, in the movie Finding Nemo with the turtle that gets caught up in the current and is screaming, righteous, righteous, right? Like that's, I, I don't use the word righteousness a lot. So maybe it's good to think about what righteousness is. Righteousness is achieving a standard. It's meeting a requirement. It's, it's kind of crossing the line of what is necessary and needed for wholeness. Maybe a good word for righteousness today in our, the way we think about it is enough. To be righteous is to be good enough. To be righteous is to be done enough. To be righteous is to be loved enough, enough. If there's any like thing that the 21st century human soul craves for, as we live amongst so much stuff, so much stuff is to know you're enough, to know it's enough. You know, I often think if I could pull over on Egberth Road and grab a couple of these college kids and look them in the eye and say, what if I told you like, I don't know what you, what's in store for you, but what if I told you when it was all done, you would, you would be able to say it was enough. Like I was good enough, I had enough, I lived enough, I loved enough. What if, what if that's all I could promise you? That it would be enough. And you'd have a deep sense of enoughness. See, I think if I said that to them, and I think if they, if they said, yeah, like I'd, I'd be good with that. Whatever life has ahead of me, I'd be good if that's how it ends. And that, see, that's the consummation of the calling because it's living as if you have enough, if you're enough. And the crazy thing about that is you don't get it like inside of you, you get it by faith. That's what Abram understood. That's what Abraham modeled to us. He trusted God for enough and it was enough. What if I told you, right? What if I promised that? Where do you need to hear like, it's enough, it's enough. Who, who, who can even tell you that? I think only Jesus can. See, the great mystery of the Christian faith is that enoughness, righteousness, 
isn't produced inside of us. I think that's one of the things that wears people out in the modern life is that we're depending on us to get to this place of enoughness and actually only God can tell you you're enough. And the crazy thing is the way you get to be enough for God is strictly a gift. It's strictly a gift because Jesus takes, none of us are enough. We, we all fall short of the glory of God and Jesus takes his enoughness and he gives it to us. But the only way we can receive it is by faith. And that's why the consummation like of a calling is actually only felt by faith. What would it look like for you to trust God, to hear him say, it's enough, it's enough. There's a lot in Genesis and I hope, you, you, I hope we enjoy our summer together in our time in Genesis when I'm teaching it. Um, Cause I'd love for us to think about these life callings, life questions. And one of the life questions uh, that all of us wrestle with is, is calling. What is our purpose? Everybody has to find a life. In the end, lives are about uh, things to do, people to love. And what I think you discover when you really consider if you've, I'm kind of two thirds of the way through my life journey and what I'm discovering more and more is things to do and the people to love in the end are gifts. They're gifts given to me. They're not things I earn or deserve. They are the, they are the result of living a called life of taking my emptiness and allowing God to fill me with his fullness and trusting in that in such a way that I can move out into this world towards others, not to grab from them, but to give to them. That's what Abram lived. And that's why he's a hero. I pray that you find and hear the voice of God and what he's calling you to this day. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, I do pray for each one of us. Our hearts are so hungry. We have so much that we long for. But I pray that we would hear your voice. Would you fill the empty places? Would you allow us to trust you in the conflicts and the tensions of living in this world? Fill us, Lord, so we can fill others, so that we can live a called life. It's in your name, Lord, and for your sake, I pray these things. Amen. We'll see you next week, Father's Day. We look forward to uh, talking to you a little bit about Abram and his, as, as a father and as someone who like to have the gift of fatherhood. It'll be a good discussion on Father's Day. So we look forward to seeing you. Love to see you in person. If you can make it, it's great to celebrate Father's Day in church. Um, it's a great place to, to celebrate fathers and to be a father. And so I hope you can make it. God bless.